to John chapter 5. 5,000 fed. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Sea of Tiberias. Which was probably the official Roman name of the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd was following him because they had seen the signs which he continually performed on those who were sick. And Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was approaching. Jesus looked up and saw that a large crowd was coming toward him, and he said to Philip, Where will we buy bread for these people to eat? But he said this to test Philip, because he knew what he was about to do. Philip answered, Two hundred denarii, which is two hundred days' wages, worth of bread is not enough for each one to receive even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down to eat. Now the ground there was covered with an abundance of grass there. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Side note, with this number of men, the total number of people may have exceeded 10,000. Disciples did not have enough money to buy so much food, and the smaller villages in the area would not have had sufficient quantity of bread to sell them. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, note he gave thanks first, he distributed them to those who were seated. The same also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they had eaten enough, he said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover pieces, so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up, and they filled twelve large baskets, with pieces from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, this miracle, they began saying, This is without a doubt the promised prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus walks on the water. Wind flowing. Then Jesus, knowing that they were going to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountainside by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and they got into a boat and started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It was already dark, and Jesus had still not come back to them. The sea was getting rough and rising high because a strong wind was blowing. Then, when they had rowed three or four miles and were near the center of the sea, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, approaching the boat, and they were terribly frightened. But Jesus said to them, It is I. I am. Do not be afraid. Then they were willing to take him on board the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore of the land to which they were going. The next day, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea realized there had been only one small boat there and that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Now some other small boats from Tiberias had come in near the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they boarded the small boats themselves and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And they found him on the other side of the sea and they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, you have been searching for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures and leads to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For God the Father has authorized him and put his seal on him. Then they asked him, what are we to do so that we may habitually be doing the works of God? Jesus answered, This is the work of God, that you believe and adhere to, trust in, rely on, and have faith in the one whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign, a testing miracle, will you do that we may see it and believe you? What supernatural work will you do as proof? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written in scripture, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, 
but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus replied to them, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never be hungry, and the one who believes in me as Savior will never be thirsty, for that one will be sustained spiritually. But as I told you, you have seen me and still do not believe. All that my Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will most certainly not cast out. I will never reject anyone who follows me, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but that I give new life and raise it up at the last day. For this is my Father's will and purpose, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him as Savior will have eternal life, and I will raise him up from the dead on the last day. Now the Jews murmured and found fault with him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They kept saying, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now have the arrogance to say, I have come down out of heaven? So Jesus answered, Stop murmuring among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, giving him the desire to come to me, and I will raise him up from the dead on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught of God. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who was with the Father and who is from God. He alone has seen the Father. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, he who believes in me as Savior, who adheres to, trusts in, relies on, and has faith in me already has eternal life, that is, now possesses it. I am the bread of life, the living bread which gives and sustains life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, believes in me, accepts me as Savior, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, unless you believe in me as Savior and believe in the saving power of my blood, which will be shed for you, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, believes in me, accepts me as Savior, has eternal life, that is, now possesses it, and I will raise him up from the dead on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood believes in me and accepts me as Savior remains in me and I in the same way remain in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, even so the one who feeds on me, believes in me and accepts me as Savior will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. It is not like the manna that our fathers ate and they eventually died. The one who eats this bread, believes in me, accepts me as Savior will live forever. He said these things in a synagogue while he was teaching in Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard this, they said, This is a difficult and harsh and offensive statement. Who can be expected to listen to it? But Jesus, aware that his disciples were complaining about it, asked them, Does this cause you to stumble and take offense? What then will you think if you see the Son of Man ascending to the realm where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh conveys no benefit. It is of no account. The words I've spoken to you are life, spirit, and life, providing eternal life. But now there are some of you who do not believe and have faith, for Jesus knew from the beginning who did not believe and who would betray him. And he was saying, This is the reason why I have told you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him, that is, unless he is unable to do so by the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples abandoned him and no longer walk with him. So Jesus said to the twelve disciples, You do not want to leave me too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You are our only hope. We have believed and confidently trusted, and even more, we have come to know by personal observation and experience that you are the Holy One of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve disciples? And yet one of you is a devil, an ally of Satan. Now he was speaking of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve disciples, was about to betray him. Here's a note. Verse 6, chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus uses the words, I am, over 20 times in this gospel. Especially memor memorable are those places where I am is followed by a metaphor that declares his deity in relationship to mankind as Savior. This is the first of seven such references. In verse 66, it does not refer to the original 12 disciples, but to many others who have followed him and claimed to be his disciples to this point. They were the unbelievers of verse 64. Judas is the only one of the 12 singled out. The Greek word at that days, i.e. disciple, simply means learner and does not necessarily designate a believer. So chapter 6 has some pretty powerful stuff. When Jesus tells them that he, they, he, they have to, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood believes in me, a savior and has eternal life. And, and I'll raise him up on the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood believes in me, remains in me and I in him the same way remain. This really threw the, these uh, other learner disciples off because their hearts weren't open to the truth. They, they couldn't accept what he said. They could only see the surface of what he said. And they're like, he's telling us to be cannibals. And that's where they just stopped with it. They didn't pray about it. They didn't ask God to reveal the truth. They didn't ask him to explain much, though he did explain it to them. But they weren't willing to understand or accept the truth or continue on that journey with him. So many left him right that, right then. And we see that in the actual um, the actual Christian way. We got a lot of people that, hey, yeah, I want, I'm, I want to get saved. Yeah, yeah, this, that. They're all for church until something comes along that doesn't rub. I should say it doesn't tickle their ears or it doesn't it confronts perhaps a sin in their life and they don't want to let go of that so they're like church isn't for me or they find a way to get out of it or they just kind of float off and that's when we have people like that when they're not taught more when they're not disciple disciple um that's how people kind of fall off the wagon So if you have new people, new believers, oh, that train. Be sure to keep up with them because they, they're like, it's just like when you get a, a, you have a student in class, you don't just give them the book and say, oh, I'm glad you came to school, carry on. No, they need to be taught. They need to be coached. Just keep that in mind. Here comes the train. See you later. Before I go, just want to make Make it clear that I'm not saying Jesus didn't want to disciple these guys that left. Jesus already knew what was in their hearts and knew they were not teachable, that they weren't going to crack. So he let them go. I'm talking about in our own lives, it made me think about this, when our own lives, when we get new believers in our church or in our group, we don't just say, oh, here's the book, here's the Bible, glad you got saved. See you in Sunday school, and you see him on Sundays, and that's about it. Until they fall off it's like just when a kid comes to school you don't just give them the book and say okay i'm so glad you came to school today i'm so glad you came to class here's your books and that's it no you have to coach them teach them let them read for themselves and learn for themselves but as someone who already knows or has been through things you have to support them you can't just let them go their way. Oh, well, so-and-so fell off the wagon again. They ain't been coming to church, and I heard they were up at the bar. Now you can call and talk to them. You don't have to say, hey, you heard you were in the bar. No, because I was just going to, like, tick them off. But if they know they've got friends out there that are support and care about where they've been, you know, 
maybe want to pray for them or pray with them or see if they have any prayer requests. Now, I'm not a real outgoing person. I look like it when I'm talking, looking like total ugh, in YouTube land. But, I mean, I don't just walk up to people and start talking the way I'm talking now. It's just not my nature. God did not make me that way. But I do check in on friends. And I have a lot of friends that don't go to church or they don't go to my church. Maybe. I don't know. They're great people. They just don't feel comfortable there. There's a lot of reasons for that. So, anyway. Just making that clear, folks.